The Deutsche Bundesbank is the independent central bank of the Federal Republic of Germany. The Bundesbank, the other national central banks in the Euro area, as well as the European Central Bank, constitute the Euro system. The Euro system is responsible for Europe's common currency, the Euro. The main objective of the Euro system is to safeguard the value of the Euro. The necessary monetary policy decisions are taken by the Governing Council of the European Central Bank. The President of the Bundesbank is a member of the Council and has a vote on monetary policy decisions. The Governing Council of the European Central Bank uses monetary policy instruments to influence interest rates in the Euro area in order to maintain annual inflation at just under 2% in the medium term. The Bundesbank implements monetary policy decisions in Germany. Via its network of branches, the Bundesbank puts Euro cash into circulation. It further ensures that there is always sufficient high-quality Euro cash available in Germany. To this end, it replaces damaged banknotes and coins and withdraws counterfeit money from circulation. Many payments are settled electronically from one account to another using a credit transfer or bank card. The Bundesbank monitors these cashless payments and ensures that the system operates smoothly. This includes providing the banks with settlement and clearing systems. As part of European banking supervision, the Bundesbank supervises individual banks in Germany to ensure that citizens' money is safe in bank accounts and that banks can fulfill their central role in the cash cycle. At the same time, it monitors the financial and monetary system in order to identify disruptions and dangers to the economy at an early stage and take countermeasures where necessary. To this end, the Bundesbank works in German, European and international institutions and committees to secure financial stability. As a central bank, the Bundesbank also has additional tasks – research, drawing up and maintaining statistics, managing the reserve assets, and it is also the German government's fiscal agent. In all of its tasks, the Bundesbank is committed to a stable currency. Tequartier is a startup and innovation hub. For two years now, uh, it's the symbol for an ongoing revolution in Frankfurt and the region. We started with a little group of fintechs. Now we have grown to a community of more than 130 startups and we have an ever-growing number of corporates ranging from the financial services industry to other industries like uh, green tech, ag tech, and even sports tech, and many more. We are entering a new age, and that age is actually called the entrepreneurial age. And it's not only the technology which is at the heart of this age, it's the human, because the human needs technology to transform society and transform humanity. And we here at Tequatir are at the heart of innovation. We actually believe that entrepreneurial acting and thinking is the core competency of the 21st century and that everybody can access this core competency and learn um, how to innovate and how to be entrepreneurial and think entrepreneurial. You can participate in our programs and get access to clients, access to talent, uh, get feedback from corporate partners, from investors. So I think what makes Tech Quartier really special is accessibility. As a founder, you get access to a network, to corporate partners, to funding and other entrepreneurs. And really Tech Quartier acts as a facilitator from the idea stage to the world stage. We invite tech founders, corporate entrepreneurs and investors to join our innovation journey and build together a better tomorrow. Hello and welcome to the demo day of the Bundesbank Innovation Challenge. My name is Lukas Schmidt, I'm the Head of Innovation Products at TechWord here and I have the honor to moderate you through this uh, special day, this special event that lays ahead of us. TechWord here stands for collaboration. So our motto is to collaborate, to innovate. So this is what we stand for and this is also what the whole Innovation Challenge has been all about over the last uh, months that we have been planning. 
This is also why I'm very happy to see the broad range of interest that we received upfront prior to the event for this demo day, this challenge here, and also for today, for tonight, for all the registration that we had on Eventbrite. So at this point, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for taking part in that great milestone of this journey that we've been taking. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed when you see the final pitches, the final solutions that you will see here tonight. For all of you that uh, don't know, might don't know uh, TechWatier by heart, TechWatier um, is connects the stakeholders within the innovation ecosystem. So we're connecting companies, startups, university, polyx, or in this case, institutions such as the Deutsche Bundesbank as our first institutional partner in our network. This is what we do, we're an innovation platform. And we have the great goal to help our partners to find the right solutions within the market and to fo uh, foster innovation due to collaboration. So with that goal, with that idea, a bit more than a year ago, we have announced our first partnership with uh, Deutsche Bundesbank. Since that day, we have been working on this very idea for this very day here today. And I'm happy to see it now finally getting realized and I'm thrilled to go through this evening here today. Uh, so we had taken a long journey and so I'm great that we're finally kicking this off. This day is really a special day as it deepens our cooperation with the Deutsche Bundesbank, but even more important, it allowed us to work on a topic that affects us all, that touches us all, even more and is even more relevant in times like we're currently facing. Over the last days, more than or 10 startups have been working, focusing on artificial intelligence to find innovative solutions in close collaboration with the departments of the Deutsche Bundesbank. They were working on areas such as risk monitoring, as, um, as banking supervision or financial stability. So this is really a topic which is really relevant and it is great to see now the final results. So without further talking much about uh, the Bundesbank itself and their challenges, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Joachim Wurmeling. He's a board member of the Deutsche Bundesbank, responsible for banking supervision, risk control, information technology. Welcome, and I'm happy to, that you have these welcome words to our uh, participants and visitors. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, welcome uh, from this, my side uh, to all of you, to the startups. I have welcomed them already uh, on Wednesday, but now for the listeners, the viewers, the observers which join us today. Uh, and I guess I'm as curious as you are uh, what the results of this uh, innovation challenge uh, now is, what the technology involved, what the business cases uh, developed. We as Bundesbank, uh, we stand for stability in the financial system, but stability needs innovation. Uh, because things are getting so complicated in this world, things are getting so fast in this world, financial markets are developing. So we need technology to better understand what's going on out there, for better analyze the risks which are out there, uh, so that we are capable to react uh, and to apply uh, the right instruments uh, to um, prevent further tur turbulences on the financial markets or finance uh, as a whole. So I'm very happy to see so many viewers uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'm also delighted, of course, uh, that this challenge uh, digitally went so smooth until now. And now I'm uh, excited about uh, the new ideas, the new uh, technologies, the innovation, the pitches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to see you in the jury. Mr. Wimling is joining our jury, so you will see him over the evening asking uh, questions to the startups. Thank you. Good luck. Have your seat, and we will see us later. So, beside uh, Mr. Wilming, we have uh, further three p um, persons on, on our jury. I would like to welcome our three further judges Kamila Hotgrave, uh, head of digital office, Alexander Schulz, head of risk analysis in the division of Bundesbank Banking and Financial Supervision Department, and Sebastian Schaefer, our managing director. Welcome. I would say we have a short introduction round, and I would like you, Kamila, to start. Uh, the stage is yours. 
Hello, all of you. I'm very, very excited to learn more about the solutions that were created by the 10 startups. And I'm very much looking forward to new, fresh ideas that could improve our work and our outcomes in regard to risk monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. The next one is Alexander Schulz. Welcome, Arne Judge. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. Um, we are looking at risk analysis of different kinds of banks. So we do very much number crunching on the existing data, uh, but we also would like to get a much better understanding of information which is outside our traditional data sources and use them uh, to our uh, complement our risk assessment. So I'm very interested uh, on what kind of uh, ideas uh, the pitches will bring to us and how we can improve through that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Sebastian, the stage is yours. Also warm welcome from my side. Um, now it's crunch time and uh, this is uh, always the most exciting part of our program. So I'm uh, wishing um, all the best to our startups, great presentations, great pitches, and uh, good discussions. So very much looking forward. All the best. Thank you, Sebastian. So really looking forward to see you in the Q&A. And now let's come to the ones that are really in the focus here tonight. Uh, I will present you the startups that are selected for, for tonight and th that will present in that order. The first one is that we have is Deepside.io. Founded in 2019, located in Osnabrück. After that, we will see Elucidate, founded in 2018, located in Berlin. Then we will see Innova Financial Solutions, founded in 2015, located in Copenhagen. After that, Confucio will present. They're founded in 2016 in Asla and are located in Asla. After that, we will see Nursinger I, one of our Frankfurt startups, founded from 2018. Then there will be Risklio, to, founded 2019, so a very young startup found, uh, in the, located in Munich. Then we will see Spin Analytics, our London participant, founded from 2015. After that, Squirrel, founded in 2018, located in Zurich. And then we, in the last but not least, we have Venalize, founded 2018, coming from Valencia. So this is our lineup, this is what we see, and I don't want to focus longer on um, on all the startups, I would like to directly dive into the pitches. For each startup, we will have five minutes per pitch. After that, we will see a Q&A coming from everyone, and um, the five minutes will end with a hard cut. The uh, jury has the opportunity to ask questions first. Then we have, uh, in, in our chat, we will get uh, ask a question from the departments. And you as participants, as visitors, you have also the opportunity to ask questions in the chat and YouTube. Our, um, our colleague will forward them to me. So if there is time for your questions, please forward them. If there is no time, we will, can, uh, we will ask them later on and pass them to the startup. So feel free to engage, feel free. After we see the nine pitches, unfortunately one startup uh, is not able to pitch today. So we will have nine pitches today. Uh, we will have a short break. The judges will then evaluate the winner and then we see the final ones that have the opportunity to collaborate with further projects with the Bundesbank that will be announced later on. So I, want, uh, I would like to start with the first startup, Deepside.io, with Dr. Alexander Meyer as a co-founder who will present. Is Alexander with us? Alexander, yes. can you hear us? Yes, Perfect. can you hear me? Perfect. Feel free to share your side. You have five minutes, as we as said. I will have, we have a hard cut after that, so take your time. The stage right. is yours as soon as we share. Perfect. Go on, Alexander. All right. Hi, I'm Dr. Alexander Meyer. I'm the tech side CEO of DeepSide, and we are using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to analyze data, and we are highly specializing into complex text data. So that's our thing. And we founded last year in January, and we are seven people now, and we're constantly growing. But despite our age, um, we had the chance to work with a variety of companies from different fields. And we started with employee and customer surveys. So we semantically analyzed the text from open questions like, why would you recommend this pro product or what is working well in the company? 
Um, we additionally did a lot of web scraping uh, with online and offline data quickly change, well, turns into a data kraken. And in that relation, we did entity extraction. So if you have news articles online and you would like to know, for example, who's sponsoring a sports team for how much, for which duration, etc. And in that sense, we also do anonymization, like kicking out personal data from medical reports or surveys. And we want to propose, well, not a research project per se, but kind of like a proof of concept um, in the financial stability challenge. And as it's common for research, we would start with a hypothesis. And so we claim that the financial stability can benefit from monitoring and predicting the real estate market. And for that, we can combine the quantitative data with qualitative text data um, from a wide variety of sources. And with us, you are able to access really interesting text data and their insights. So how, what are these sources? How do they look like? And we are looking for a collaboration here. And we think that the Bundesbank probably has a lot of data on credit and mortgage and financial data, also demographics. And we saw some surveys, so market research data, and we could complement this with text data from different areas. And there's very useful data and not so useful data. Um, we are, for example, not a fan of social media because it's like very unreliable, especially in that sense. But we would focus on like real world newspapers and online newspapers, of course, um, real estate portals like ImmoScout, et cetera, to get quantitative data. Um, call for tenders for property, for example, or buildings that are planned, and also maybe Google Trends and analytics. Um, to get a little bit into the methods, I hope I don't gonna lose you here, but there are four steps. So first we have the data acquisition. So we do the web scrapping online. For the offline we need, it's called object character recognition. So we will turn PDFs into text we can actually process. For the quantitative data, which is more on the Bundesbank side or from ImmoScout, for example, we would use unsupervised clustering algorithms. And we published a paper a couple of years ago, um, which doesn't just use a single one because it's highly dependent on which algorithm you use, but like a conglomeration, which is way more robust. Uh, third, we have the sentiment analysis to find out the mood of news. And fourth, it's a, a approach of a semantic hybrid analysis. So on the one side, we have predefined topics, which are easier to compare over time. And on the other side, we have um, unsupervised topic modeling. So there we can detect new topics or anomalies like uh, Corona, for example. Okay, so how could we use these sources? We will propose a proof of concept, um, which is, well, a little bit like a paper that was in the challenge. So we could pick like 35 regions in Germany like from villages to big cities with um, widely varying demographics. For example, we could look at the last 10 to 15 years and see if the sentiments or the moods in these different data sources correlate with the house pricing development. This already has quite some value, but we can optionally add to this surveys. Surveys you're already doing, we could supplement this with uh, open questions or create new ones and ask people who are really interacting with the real estate market. market. And such questions could be, for example, about mortgage limits. And this could, that's the hypothesis, um, make us predict like the next two years. Okay, so what to expect as a result? Um, we will have an improved market feeling through real people. We can monitor the real estate market based on near real-time data. And potentially we will have predictions on the near future development. This obviously can spill over to other areas. Alexander, so your up, time is there's up. There's a high potential to add real value by tapping me? in and combining a wide variety of data sources. So with the knowledge of the Bundesbank and the data um, combined with the text we acquire and the analytics we have, we will gain a better understanding why the market did what it did. And Alexander, we need to make come. a hard cut. Okay. I hope you can, okay. That's your, it. Yeah. <laughs> your time is over. Thank you very much. Um, we have a hard cut. Now let's directly dive into the question from the jury. Thank you for the presentation. Hello, dear judges. 
you have someone <laughs> yeah, has a so. microphone on or the sound perfect. So what are your questions? Alexander is ready to answer everyone. Who want to start? Okay, so I'm uh, starting. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, concepts. Um, how would you integrate uh, demographic data into your assessments? And demographic data in form of age and uh, is there a specific demographic data you're looking for or just all of them with the text analysis with the text data? Yeah, okay. well, in general, we can um, we can use the different clustering algorithms and build correlations between the different topics of the text with um, demographics and like partition them into target groups. If that answers your question. Yeah, and you said you would uh, have near real term information. Typically, uh, real estate information um, coming from uh, official sources always have a significant lag. Um, why are you confident to be able to bridge that? Well, if you look at ImmoScout, for example, we would have a, well, still a delay, but it would be in a matter of days. So um, with near real time, it's like in a matter of days and weeks, I would say. Um, yeah, with surveys, they can be quite quick, but it highly depends on how they are conducted. So it's not real time directly. But okay. I'm, I'm uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how fast this ne it needs to be. So. <laughs> well, thank, yeah, you thank, you thank you very much. Okay. okay, thank you very much thank for that. Much. We still have it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, well, there are, of course, uh, traditional uh, to analyze uh, the, uh, the market uh, with granular data, with reporting from the banks uh, and uh, alike. Uh, indeed, here uh, we have a then very price, precise picture. Uh, but, uh, like uh, Alexander said, uh, with a big delay. Uh, so you are proposing to uh, mix uh, various types of data to come to, to uh, as a basis for the analyze. How would you make, uh, or how would you test uh, that the different sources um, bring about a realistic uh, picture? So. Could you um, teach uh, the algorithm uh, with previous data uh, and the knowledge about uh, the real uh, the, the real situation uh, to uh, to teach uh, the algorithm um, to make these uh, forecasts and uh, to test it uh, so that you finally ultimately arrive at an optimal mix of and weight and so on of the various sources. Yes, for that, um, we would use the data of the last 10 years, for example, and to really test it and how it's performing in different areas. And I mean, there is like for Google Trends, you can go back until 2004 and there are archives on newspapers, like print newspapers we could use and then try to like see how those uh, milestones or pain points, I don't know, like the um, real estate crash 2008 and how it behaves. And maybe we can go back even 30 years or so, and then we can train models and see um, which are like the decisive sources and the most reliable ones. Of course, that's no guarantee. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a gamble, to be honest. Um, but this could really help. And the more data we have, um, on past events, the more reliable it can be. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's about, okay, do those predictions hold for the next two years? Perfect. Thank you very much for the answer. The five minutes are over. Thank you, Dr. Wimmeling. Thank you, Mr. Schultz, for the questions. But most of all, uh, thank you, Alexander, for your pitch.
So we're coming to the next startup. The next one is Max from Elucidate, who is uh, in the call. Max, are you there? Can you share the presentation with us? Yep, so you should hopefully be seeing my screen. Yep, we see your screen. Perfect, and you five know. minutes will start now. Brilliant. So we are Elucidate. One second. We are, we are Elucidate, and we are already helping major banks tackle one of their most critical systemic risks, financial crime and money laundering. Our product is being used by banks, and we are also regulated by Baffin, the German regulatory authority. What we want to share today is how the capabilities we've developed can help the Bundesbank with the risks we understand you are trying to tackle. One, sorry, one second, change the slide. One of the largest challenges for the financial sector is tackling illicit activity, including money laundering and financial crime. Money laundering is huge, up to 5% of global GDP. And yet at the same time, it is very difficult to detect. When you process millions of bank transfers a day, it is really hard to pinpoint that one transaction that is linked to criminal trafficking or tax evasion. Being exposed to money laundering can destabilize a bank and even put at risk entire sectors or economies. Not long ago, the largest bank in Denmark was caught up in a major scandal that impacted not just its share price, but business confidence in the whole country. Our company, Elucidate, was set up in Berlin in 2018 by senior compliance officers in global banks and software companies who had gotten frustrated with existing systems to tackle risks of illicit activities. How we help our clients is, we give them a strategic view of which areas of their business are most exposed to risks of illicit activity, generating metrics to support both monitoring and mitigation. To do this, we work with the bank's own data combined with data scraped from the public domain. We analyze that data through various methods, including natural language processing. What we then do is we run this data against our model to give the bank scores across nine areas of risk. This is how they can identify which areas need closer attention and also generate concrete recommendations on how to improve their systems. Our product is already being used by major banks in Europe and Asia. And we have also been registered by the German regulatory authority, Baffin, as a benchmark administrator, which means they validated the reliability and transparency of our model. Our clients, use our product for various purposes. In addition to prioritizing resources and focusing on the areas most exposed to risk, they use it to automate their internal risk management processes and to test and validate their existing risk models. One unique feature is that because our product is designed as a standard or benchmark, it allows banks to compare themselves with banks in their networks, identifying possible contagion risks and vulnerabilities they may be exposed to through those networks. For example, we recently helped a major bank look at its network in Eastern Europe and identify a growing cluster of illicit activity they had with, let's say, a sunny Mediterranean location. These funds were getting mixed with domestic funds and had then been sent to other institutions around the world. In fact, they were starting to generate systemic risk with banks' balance sheets containing increasing amounts of questionable assets. Once in the economy, these funds could easily have gone on to distort other sectors, such as real estate. So what do we bring to the Bundesbank? Our in-depth understanding of risks in the banking sector, particularly by how illicit finance can create risks to individual institutions and to systemic trust. Our capability in data collection from diverse sources, and a fully operational product that is already generating insights about risk areas in banks and networks today. We believe all of these are relevant to Bundesbank use cases and to the overall stability mandates of the Bundesbank. Not least, we bring the capacity to execute. In our first two years, we have developed a completely new product. We've become regulated and we've successfully gone to market working with major banks. So 
just to recap, it's been a long, long day and, and week, I'm sure. These are the two things to remember from these five minutes. First, it is possible to quantify financial crime risk. We know because at Elucidate, we are already doing it. Second, once this risk is reliably measured, the method can be applied to a range of systemic risks in a sector or across sectors. When you start tackling risk and in this way, Max, there's almost no limit your time to the possible over. applications. Thank you very much and looking forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Max. So we will go to, directly into the Q&A. Next to Max, will um, Philippe and Julian will join the Q&A on the side of Lucidate. Judges, the stage is your who has a question to Max and the team. Max, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Did you have one particular use case in mind for which you could provide a solution from our side? Because you focus in general a lot on fraud and financial crime. Yep. So I'll, I'll ask my colleagues, uh, Philippe and Julian, to, to jump in to help here. But uh, the main, we, we've spoke to several teams and uh, we thought with financial stability, we had a good connection. So the, the, the um, use case was about real estate specifically, but the, the conversation went into several angles where there was a clear link between financial crime risk and financial stability. Of course, risk controlling and banking supervision were also sort of the, the most natural fits. To, we, we had really good, good talks with, with those teams also. Yes, exactly. And I would just like to emphasize that we, what we can do also fits in with the, Bundes, the wider Bundesbank mission of financial stability. Because as we kind of spoke about before in the presentation, 5%, uh, estimated 5% of GDP is illicit funds. And that arguably, you know, is possibly a threat to financial, to just all of economic stability. Okay, uh, I would have a follow-up question. Um, how, how would you bring that information to our attention? Um, you work on the bank's own data systems. So this is, of course, then your work with the banks. Um, our data is typically much, uh, at a much lower frequency. We have monthly or even quarterly reporting. Plus, you can use any kind of publicly available information. So how um, do you think you would bring um, exactly uh, these network um, effects which you demonstrated here in your presentation to our attention? Yes. So one, your method of data collection matches ours pretty well already. We have, you know, we do natural language processing on open source data. Um, when our banks send us data on a monthly basis as well. So. There are also, you know, what we understand is that the Bundesbank also has its own kind of, pro not proprietary, but its own data sources that could kind of help benefit um, our purview of the whole financial system too. And three, we all, you know, four, we also, our existing product is a, pro is, you know, it's, propri it's a proprietary aggregation of, you know, financial crime risk across many institutions across many countries. And that evolves over time too. It's recalculated constantly. So it's probably, you know, as live as as current as any kind of solution will permit at the moment. Thank you. Um, could you quantify the uh, effect um, with your solution uh, in comparison to other solutions on the market? Quantify in terms of effect. I can I can yeah. tell you that when banks see their scores from, you know, or, or they use our, you know, metrics to look at their own financial crime risk or that of their, you know, parties within their system, within counterparties within their system, they definitely do take effort to mitigate that. Um, and you can, over, you know, over time, you can see, okay, if a bank takes, you know, time to, to handle this, they will decrease their score, they will decrease their risk, and they definitely have um, a bias towards taking internal efforts that decrease the financial risk overall and you would any and yeah you just definitely track across our system over time and just to add to that so what we do is actually the quantification of the of the risk uh, all the banks whatever they're using at the moment it's not a real score it's a high medium low level of risk and we go into a quantification of that risk thank you perfect thank you very much we have time for one last question is there any from the judges? Perfect. We didn't receive any from the audience, so thank you very much to uh, to you for your pitch. 
Uh, we will see if your pitch made it to the winner, winning team. Looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much for, for your pitch. The next startup that we're looking for is now Nivora Final Solution, uh, Financial Solutions with Sinan. Sinan, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, uh, I Perfect. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The timer is set and the stage is yours. Okay, and you see the slides? Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. Very good. So uh, I'm Sinan Gable. I'm from Innova Financial Solutions mm -hmm. and we are situated in uh, Copenhagen. We, um, sorry, Let's see if I can. Um, we work in the space of economics and uh, fintech, reg tech, and energy, energy prices. We are specialized in AI and machine learning and big data. We have clients in the EU, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. Here's an example of one of our AI uh, solutions. We have uh, made a house price predictor for the Danish home market. So we predict houses, house prices for uh, houses, apartments, and uh, country houses. And we uh, do that for all the zip codes and all the communes in the country. We have assembled um, the model over time. We started in the beginning of 2000 and, uh, and uh, let me see, in 19. And we started with a smaller model and then we have kind of uh, built it up over time. So now we have um, the geographical areas that we, where we use uh, the geo positions in the model. We have the population size, we have the internet advertised home prices and categories and supply and demand. We have the actual uh, realized home, home uh, traded prices that we get from the official uh, databases, but which are up to 12 months lag. So that's why we use the internet uh, prices, which are updated monthly. We have things like the stock and bond indexes that tell us something about the, um, the uh, economic sentiment and the price of borrowing money. Uh, we have, um, let me see, what else? Yeah, things like that. So in the, in the first picture, you see, you could say a training set that is nearly ready uh, to go into the AI model. This is how it looks. Everything has to be converted to numbers. There are two columns that will disappear from that. So that's the one where you see the text and the dates. They don't uh, enter into the, to the model. So we have 3.5 million rows. We have uh, 40 data points, 40, you could say, dimensions in the model. And on in number two, you can see a small extract on when we train the model. So the model is trained and the output is price per square meter for each area. And when we have trained the model and make the predictions, we can actually um, visualize it. Uh, either in this case, it's an extract from a small experimental website we did for the for the uh, results. And we make predictions 12 months ahead, one month each. So for each area, each commune zip code, we have a range of prices per square meter for each uh, home category. So that's an example. Now, something you need to take into account when you work with AI, you probably will experience that you use 90% of your time and resources on getting data, making data, data ready and all that and you only spend 10% on the actual modeling. So this is Im important to understand. Another thing is that in a, you could say in a typical classical regression type modeling, you get into a, a, a stage where you cannot, you know, crunch more data and you, can, you cannot have too many dimensions in the model. With AI, that is not a problem. You can actually more or less increase, you know, indefinitely, both in terms of numbers of, um, of rows in the model and also in the dimensions, we can find solutions for that. We have a workflow monitoring system where we have computer workers, they take an input and create an output and each of these workers, they depend on each other and they ensure that the whole process is handled correctly and it communicates back if something not, does not work. Just imagine if you are scraping a site and that site has changed the whole way that it's, you know, presented, then you need to get a feedback into this whole workflow so that you uh, are able to make corrections and so on. This is an automated process and ensures that everything is done in a good way. We can work with text, numbers, files, sounds, pictures, and videos, and we are specialized in data that has a time dependency. Here's an example of a natural language processing. We did a, st uh, a chatbot 
that could take a question in the in the in, in either as a speak or as a text. And here's an example where you say, "Tell me about Volvo AB on the Stockholm uh, Stockholm Stock Exchange," and then the uh, the system it uh, interprets the uh, the text, and if and it knows that Volvo AB, okay, that's a stock. It looks up the ticker, and it looks up the price on the uh, on the market, uh, and then it makes a calculation about the high and low within the next 30 days, and then it uh, constructs a sentence and sends it back uh, either as text or as Zina, sound. Finish your last sentence, the last word, final word to the public. Uh, it sends back the result as okay, then uh, either as text. Then, then we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining from Copenhagen. We have to ha make the hard cut here. Sorry, you were okay, the first sorry. one. Yeah. Uh, thanks you for joining. Next to him is Victor in the Q&A. Let's dive into Q&A. Five minutes to the judges. Who wants to start? Let's start with the first question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting approach. Um, how would you uh, incorporate that into um, a framework of action? If you have 12 month prediction ahead, uh, statistically probably that's very valuable. Um, politically, um, if you start to act once you react, your system reacts, um, given the lag in real estate, won't that be too late? Sorry, I, I, sorry um, I didn't get the last part. 12, 12 months ahead is your prediction. Um, yes. Is that sufficient, uh, given that uh, real estate markets uh, move very slow? So if I get now a warning from your system, and even if we would act ultimately, it might very well be that the policy action is well too late um, because uh, the dynamics of real estate markets are slow moving, very fundamental. Yes. Isn't that? So I guess, I mean, that, with... yes, so I guess, um, in that two, I, I guess that two ways, one is kind of to try to make, uh, maybe lo longer term predictions. We have not tried that yet. We started when we, uh, with three months and then we increased to six and then to 12. And uh, we haven't tried it actually on two or three or four years. Uh, th that is one thing. The other is that you can use it as an indicator in a bigger model so that you have a, a bigger economic model where this is just, you know, an input into that model. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how is this information um, received in the, in the markets? Uh, if it's well received, it could turn out as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I think um, if you look at, for instance, the, der the derivatives markets, uh, that is a market where you can see that people trade, there's a demand and supply, but people have very different you know, expectations about if things are going up and down. So I think that will be the same here. So you have people with different expectations and different reasons for doing their trades. And just like you have a commodity trader, a farmer who needs to hedge his uh, corn, uh, then you have on the other side somebody who's speculating and want to you know, say, OK, I want to buy that contract and speculate. Uh, so I think that will be a little bit the same here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any Could you please yeah. Sebastian? elaborate a little on the team who is with you? Uh, um, uh, that's Victor, uh, who is also uh, on our team uh, uh, here uh, with us today. And then uh, we have people sitting in Copenhagen and in, uh, in Sweden also currently. Uh, how many? Uh, we are five on average, but I would say it's because we have some that are part time. So if you, if you have a headcount, it's it's about ten people, but full time it's about five. Thank you. Perfect. If there any are there any further questions? If not, we have one from one of the departments. How do you use sound for unsupervised risk monitoring? So sound. How do I what? Use sound. What, sorry. How do you use sound for unsupervised risk monitoring? How you include that? 
Wow. Ah, the sound. Yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, you could say the sound is not used here in this in this in this particular model. Uh, now, in the um, in the chatbot model, uh, we do use sound. The sound is then converted to text, and then there's a, a text uh, interpretation by a machine learning model. That's how we do it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for answering. If there are no further questions, You're welcome. thank you for joining us from thank Copenhagen you. and your insights. Then um, enjoy the rest of the pitches and we will come to the next startup, which is uh, Confucio. Christopher Helm is the CEO who is with us today. Christopher, are you there? I just joined. Thank you. Perfect. This, this, we can see your slides. The five minute will start now. Thank you. So I have one question. Why would you crack a walnut? because you want to get to the kernels. But why are walnuts related to unstructured data? As walnuts, unstructured data is not only hard to crack, but information kernels are also hard to get. So let me introduce to you the nutcracker for your data. My name is Chris, and I'm the CEO of a company called Helmut Nagel GmbH. And our software, Confucio, is used by major clients to process text data, which are Siemens, Deutsche Bahn, Sparkassen. We are a tool provider, and you are the expert. So we help your experts to consume more data faster. And we have been awarded recently by Deutsche Telekom and Wirtschaftswoche uh, to be the pioneer, the German pioneer in cognitive information extraction. So many enterprises do information extraction manually. They read documents and PDFs, they highlight segments with a marker, and they come up with a summary of what they have read. Using the latest research like Layout LM, VGG16, BERT model, graph convolution, and Chakrit, our software is able to read uh, text similar to humans, capture segments like tables and paragraphs, and categorize individual information and also um, paragraphs in total. So how are companies using it? Euler Hermes is processing balance sheets in Italy to automate information retrieval for credit scoring. Deutsche Bahn is processing Planfeststellungsbeschlüsse to detect tasks mentioned by the Eisenbahn Bundesamt automatically and to create and assign tasks to employees. Allianz is processing offering memorandums to automate an SPPI test according to RFS9. They have trained the machine to detect triggers, which might indicate that the bond is not solely principal and interest. Deutsche Rück, as a reinsurer, is processing individual letters written by doctors to determine the health status of injuries. So how do you use it? It is super simple. We provide a web interface, which can be hosted on premises and on SaaS. So what you need is just data. We have done it with receipts as a demo here. And for example, within 11 minutes in this video you can download from our homepage, one working student trains the AI, um, provides feedback to the AI, and evaluates the AI. So this is like a one-stop shop for all information procedures you want to have. So we not only provide information or like pre-trained models to business users, which use our application by the browser backend, web end, but also allow data engineers to train and run their own models in our data. So we think there are different challenges at Deutsche Bank where we can collaborate and create synergies. For example, reading all menu reports of all 3,200 supervised institutions would take 25 people a full year of reading we can not only identify major events in annual reports, but also provide background information in a, a some separate summarized text. So what do we bring into the collaboration? We bring a SaaS and on a premise uh, solution, which is used several thousand times a day by major clients. And we bring latest research out of the box for NLP and computer vision. Your experts can build your own AI or train it via the web interface. You can connect an existing open source solution or standard software to our platform and automate documents, emails, and any text data fully automatically. 
built in house, we provide the best support you can get on the German market and provide major data connectors for any major data source. So even if we are ahead of time, there's one question to think of. When do you want to start to, tr to crack into unstructured text data? Perfect. Perfectly on time. Thank you, Christopher. Um, we will directly dive into the Q&A with the judges. So, first question. Let's presume we want to start now. What would be the first concrete step to tailor your solutions for us at Deutsche Bundesbank? Um, you go on www.kotfuzi.com, register and upload your first documents. From there you can start. So um, we can provide support for your site, but normally we see that our business user can customize the AI fully via the web interface and only need some some training uh, like with the with the web interface itself. So it's like a really like it's we are a platform provider, we are a solution provider, and we can help you to get to understand our AI better and uh, the other way around that we understand you better. This would be, for example, a workshop day within two or three hours. Um, <clears throat> well, it's interesting that uh, uh, very different types of, uh, uh, of information and you analyze documents, it's text mining, images, it's, uh, recognition of the images. But what's uh, very interesting, uh, uh, much more interesting for me is what do you expect from the sheets? Because this requires much more than recognition of uh, figures, but also kind of uh, next step analyze. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, so we specialize in the information procedure, so to um, convert unstructured data to the structured data. And if you want to do follow-up actions, you can actually either connect like your solution for if you have a credit scoring algorithm in-house. So it, this can consume the data from our platform and actually automate like the information or the information procedure to get those information. Um, you could also run the model, for example, the credit scoring model in this data hub. So you would upload a balance sheet, extract the information and provide your own core logic um, to uh, do a credit scoring there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, ultimately, after all, it's our own analytical competence, uh, which are, say, enshrined in the system. It's not your own judgment. And we, we are the objective expert. Uh, we are experts for that, what you want to extract. You are the mm -hmm. expert for how do you want to interpret what you extract. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How could you deal with uh, separated data sets? So, for example, assume for mm -hmm. certain um, data protection rules, we can um, collect information on a bank basis. So we have, let's say, 100 banks to make it easy. And I go in bank one, collect information with your system. Then I go into bank two, collect information, but I cannot pool the information, but I need to extract meta information and then only match uh, this meta information or uh, summary statistics or whatever that is. How could uh, you help we, us with that? Uh, we see it all over uh, the place, uh, separating of data like Chinese walls in between. And we do it by um, allowing users to create new projects which can access the same AI model. So for example, we have one data scientist building an AI model, or we have trained we have trained by the web interface. M multiple models can access one AI, um, uh, like one artificial intelligence. So you can separate the data, can also store it separately on a hard drive. I want to co connect like an FTP server or a blob storage. So you can separate it independently, but you can extract it with one trained AI. And we have the same for Thank users you. and groups. So we have like the full security layer on top of it, which is comes mm -hmm. at hand within the box. Okay, we have one minute left. Time for one last question. Anyone? But then let uh, let me ask you, uh, Christopher. So what what's the vision? Where is uh, Confucio and your company in five years? 
uh, we are the input management system to provide uh, the kernels, the information kernels, so enterprise can focus on their major tasks and their major competence, which is pro making decisions based on data. And this enables like large enterprises with new business models and also streamlines the process. So we enable her from our perspective in five years as we are today. Perfect. Thank you very much. Very insightful. And thank you also for the demo. I wish you the best of luck for winning this challenge. So we will now dive into the next uh, startup. We will now see Neusinger AI here from Frankfurt. Eduard Singer is the managing partner of uh, Neusinger. Welcome, Eduard. Are you here with us? Yes. Eduard. Hi. Perfect. Can Good you time see to... me? Can you see my presentation? We can see you. Share your screen. And then can, we can definitely see you now. <laughs> um, second. Take but uh, also my presentation? Yes, not, not your presentation, not yet. No? No, we can still see you. OK, I will try once more. So now, now we see your presentation. OK, Eduard, the time starts now. Go, stage is yours. So, um, um, hello everybody, and thank you very much uh, to having me uh, here, us here. Neusinger is a young company um, based in Frankfurt. Uh, we specialized in AI and uh, software development. And this challenge, we are represented by four people, Andy and uh, Alex, uh, our very experienced AI experts and uh, Sergey, our data architect, and me with my organizational tasks. All of us have many years of experience with corporations, large banks, and startups, and we uh, actively participate in the development and dissemination of AI in Germany by being represented in the AI Bundesverband and by leading of the AI lab Kurfiles in Heidelberg. Um, our AI platform contains three modules relevant to the Bundesbank challenge, web-based collection of companies' information, advanced AI methods for anomaly detection on distributed data, and explainable monitoring of specific real estate marketing components. This is based on our own methods and can be flexibly integrated into the bank infrastructure. Um, from our experience, uh, the ways of using our services and the database are very individual for each customer, so um, we deliberately avoid a nice graphical interface and focus on maximum technical integration. So flexible, cooperative, and very motivated uh, with high in integrative approach due to technical framework and flexible customizing, NLP, web scraping, data acquisition from up and websites, and now a parallel processing of distributed data. That's a very efficient anomaly detection. That is our USPs. Our module one looks at a web-based collection of data about different types of companies using natural language processing and grape-based structure of the data. And this model serves the internet for uh, uh, companies with a specific focus, extracts necessary information from their websites and establishes and evaluates the multi-level links to other companies and related to that company. Our module two offers advanced methods for anomaly detection we achieve very high accuracy with low false positive um, rates thanks to the use of AI techniques like outer encoder, ZSpace, and GAN networks. Model three of our AI platform deals with the fine and granular analysis of segments of the real estate market. We not only monitor the real estate prices in different regions, but we also break them down and create an explanation according to subcategories such as floor space, number of bathrooms, interior energy efficiency, and so on. Predictions based on this information are used to derive the macroeconomic KPIs for financial stability. So here we see three challenges of the Bundesbank in which our AI tools are very well applied, banking supervision, financial stability, and statistics. Um, our model one with the web-based data acquisition about companies is created for this challenge. 
for use at the Bundesbank, the tool has to be converted to the properties of fintechs. Then our AI automatically forms list of uh, fintechs with a connection to other companies and key master data and searches for new fintechs. So anomaly detection is a web-based information about bank. This is uh, where two models of our platform come into play simultaneously. Model one for web-based data acquisition about banks and module two for the advanced analytics of anomalies in the collected data. After the collection of the most important master data and connections to other companies, a sentiment analysis in various economic areas is created for the bank itself and other organizations like linked to it. For this purpose, various web portals and RSS feeds are taped. And then module two comes into play and analyze analysis, anomalies in the multidimensional sentiments across all connections to the bank to provide the corresponding warning message. So a fine structured monitoring of the real um, estate market. We are using our model three here, but due to the time we have available, please feel free to ask us question, questions about it. And once more, our USPs here. Um, thank you very much for your attention and we're happy to answer your question. questions. Perfect, thank Eduard. You. Perfectly in time, directly on the second. Uh, thanks for the great pitch and to show how the solution worked with the challenges that were provided up front. With, with uh, him is Andy also on board for the Q&A. Let's dive into the Q&A. Five minutes, sure. the first question, go. Well, thank you very much. A uh, very interesting uh, concept. Uh, may I uh, test the concept? I'm asking you whether you would be able to tell us um, which companies uh, will go bankrupt uh, after the uh, COVID lockdown? Um, I can tell you, thank you for the question. I can tell you that uh, right after the COVID happened, we were able to see and predict in a couple of months the, uh, the problem with uh, real estate market in the United States. So it was a virus, but from other side, in some areas we saw that uh, it, it's actually rising, like in the not very crowded areas, uh, the, 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 uh, the price on the market where the market was uh, rising. So answering directly to your question, it is able to do it, but not uh, right during the moment when it happens, but a couple of weeks after, we will catch the news from RSS feeds that something happens. Let's say people, uh, let's say if we use our real estate model, we will see that people stop to buy uh, condominiums and start to buy houses, uh, let's say uh, somewhere from the big towns and that means that will have some consequences with logic operation in that city so let's say we can see some trends in this for economics but we cannot tell directly for which company it will make a some situation bad or good thank you thank you next thank question you. i suppose we could use your module separately from each other um, so, uh, for example, the anomaly detection could then work on um, traditional supervisory data, I assume. And second, uh, you said that you uh, could also identify key drivers, um, so uh, giving more of an explanation than it's a statistical anomaly. Could you elaborate on that, please? Uh, yes, you're correct. As uh, uh, Edward already told that we are focusing on our main goal, which is actually data analysis and created decision making engines. So we're not focusing on a UI part of this. That means we are we are producing a microservices and code for these microservices. And then it can be incorporated in any solution that is already in place. So we are very flexible in this sense. You um, created a model for the U.S. housing market. The data for the U.S. housing market differs much from the German database because I'm in the German housing market. The database is much more detailed, um, much better available. So how would you 
um, transfer this model to the German housing market? Uh, thank you for the question. So basically, if you are talking about just models that are scraping and grabbing data from the internet, from news, they are the same because we are just doing th this is global things. And re regarding the real estate market, as you uh, told, yes, the data is different, but it, it is different on some aggregator sites. If you, we are using data that are directly from the data provider, so-called uh, multiple listing services, which are pretty much the same. Why? Because actually house has the same properties in the United States and in Germany. So that means the general models will work the same. For example, uh, coming from my side, maybe in Germany, for example, there are some data sources uh, you can use for prediction. For example, uh, ebau.de, uh, that's a kind of uh, um, data bank of uh, construction uh, for the construction so to say it can be used i mean you can adapt to the local data sources but the logic how we aggregate and how we use the data it's very similar so i think that's would be as additional to, to the answer thank you very much are there any further questions one minute left for final one or maybe i could add a question which does not uh, um, Distinct from my responsibility, but it's rather from monetary policy issues because one of uh, the major criteria uh, for monetary policy action uh, is the inflation expectation of the public or uh, the, uh, the market participants. Could you imagine to uh, derive from uh, social media, internet, whatever uh, source, uh, what are the maybe the trends in uh, inflation expectation on a real-time basis? That's particularly interesting now because uh, uh, the discussion about uh, increase of inflation is, is let's say, kind of uh, growing, but it's not still there. Uh, but we would like to know whether people start to begin uh, to forecast a higher inflation than in the past? Um, I can uh, tell you following that from, uh, from our experience, if you try to uh, predict, let's say, Bitcoin, in 80% of uh, models, they are wrong. So um, uh, if you try to touch this problem in, like, directly, what is, you have some time series, and you want to say, what will be in the future? This is um, almost uh, impossible, I mean, in long term, w which we would like, of course. But this is possible if you look on some indirect things, like how people are using, for example, their houses. Do they buy houses? Do they rent houses? Or do they buy a commercial, uh, let's say, real estate? And this is very valuable indicator for, uh, uh, for the GDP and for the inflation and other economical things that we maybe we are not strong in but we are strong in this indirect um let's say per parameters that can help to find and uh, translate them to direct ec economic things okay. thank you very much we have uh, no time left thank unfortunately you. we have um in between i would like to say we received a lot of questions also from the audience and also from the departments for use information we will collect all these questions and we'll forward them to the startups and you Neusinger afterwards, so you can answer these questions. Thank you very much, Neusinger. Thank, Thank you, you Andy and Eduard. Uh, good you. luck with the pitches. So let's now focus on, uh, we have now five startups already seen, and we will now dive into the last final phase with the four last startups. The next one is Risklio with Dr. Stefan Werner. Welcome to the studio here. Can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Perfect, we can hear you. We can, can see you see screen. my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Five minutes, we'll start now. The, the stage is All yours. All right, and away we go. Thanks very much. My name is Staff, Stefan Werner. I'm uh, with Risco. We are an early stage fintech startup from Munich. And well, we, we carry risk in our name, really. So our name is a portmanteau of risk and Clio, which is the Greek muse of historiography. And I, I'm very happy that we've heard two very important aspects or concepts of the past year, which was uh, Corona and anomalies. 
and we've seen something. So I'd like to jump right in what we do by giving you the, this example of what happened last year in, in, in um, international equity markets. Uh, we didn't, we haven't seen a bull market. We have not seen a bear market. No, we have seen a kangaroo market, a market that was decidedly driven by the occurrence of events. People, investors waiting for something to happen and when it occurred, they would respond to it. Um, if you look at it from a tr standard traditional um, quantitative model, you may want to look at the probability density function of the returns of, say, the S&P 500. And you would see that uh, over the past year, well, this ends on um, 30th of April, we would actually see that there is quite some tails in it but it wouldn't tell us anything about what exactly happened in those tails. So from a certain point of view, we actually work with, uh, with, with uh, black box models and risk managing, management already. And we at Risklio, we have our um, mission to break that open. So what we would have done there is we would have really looked into those kind of events that draw financial markets. And we would have seen quite interesting correlations or um, combinations suggest that the worst days also caused the best days. So these are the kind of things that we extract. And um, this is what we do. We design artificial intelligence to analyze the cause effect relationship um, insights really between what mo moved markets, what event moved markets and, and how this translated in terms of uh, quantitative um, information. So those event driven insights we use to promote really awareness of, of events so what happens in Vegas stays on Facebook. What, what happened in the business world, it gets forgotten these days and we have to change that. And that's what we do. We, we are a team of five. Um, I started working on this in my PhD at the LSE. Um, I was working in um, financial risk consulting together with my co-founder Klaus. Klaus and Julian, the third, uh, the third guy in our gang, they worked at uh, data science consultancy Alexander Tam here in Munich. And now we have Anna and Mariana with us as well, also have a quant background actually. So that's us and um, that's what we do. We sell data, we sell smart data, but we don't only sell this data, we also, well, really provide you insight in our, the way we process this kind of information. So we have data products specifically designed for asset managers, market makers, um, predominantly based in the US and UK market. And we have data vendors with, with whom we cooperate on that. We also have risk.finance. We've decided, we've seen during um, Corona that there is a lot of questions about what's really going on in financial markets. And we've decided that we actually open up our um, demo dashboard to the public. So it is now an open beta. And if you're watching this, you can actually sign up and check out what happened yesterday in financial markets. What we also do is provide bespoke solutions. So what we have done, we've spent a lot of time and given our experience with spending a lot of time on, you know, risk tools and risk tooling in financial service in this financial service industry, we have designed a very modular system um, that we can actually employ on premise as well and fit to your every need. So let me take the last minute to give you some, some examples and details where we can address some of the challenges we see. So with risk consult controlling, this really goes down in the way we process our data. And this is really the way we do it. We crack open an encoder and, and every step of the way we provide information on those level, layers that you can actually understand and interpret as a human person as well. Every single step in this layer here, you will find on risk.finance. This is really how it would look like. You would start with the individual news, you will go up the, the tree until you can actually make your own predictions depending on what you actually want to predict. So what we can also do is, uh, instead of monitoring, I mean, in housing market, you won't find this in our data, but we can set up a model that, that really combines your information on housing markets with some price points that, might, that you might find interesting. And last but not least, you know, if you call anomaly detection, and we've come a long way because last year we were actually one of the few who said, listen up guys, wire cut is a big problem. Thank you, Stefan. And we can do exactly the same thing with more complex constructs as well. Thank you very much for your pitch. Uh, these were great insights. We need to cut here. We five minutes sure, are over. Sure. I could talk about this for hours. So that's, that's great. <laughs> that's that's great. We, we see that. Perfect. Let's dive into the Q&A with our judges. Welcome. First question.
who would like to start? Well, um, in, in Germany, we don't have uh, so many traded companies. So in banks only, very few banks have a public listing. And also uh, the bulk of the corporates um, are Mittelstand uh, without a um, publicly listed price. How could you so still I inform you, uh, about risks which banks uh, take with respect to their actors? Um that is a very good question. And the way we set up our predictor is that it, um, it, um, is, it is basically, um, it takes information, it takes data, and it aggregates it up. We do it on SIC level, we do it on sector level. So the way we aggregate it, that's, that's, that's a way to just not just predict something that happens to one individual company. But we look at, is this company based on the financial service sector, for example? So in this way, the way information gets disseminated, we understand that this may, this, uh, the target prediction would not actually have to be on a company that is listed, as long as it is similar to a company that was listed. Something like you would find on Amazon with a recommender system. That's, that's really what we have set up here, because you are right, there is not so much listed information in Germany. And making this transfer is absolutely critical for this to uh, work, especially in Germany. So we've spent a lot of time taking this into account. And my, my personal academic background is very strong rooted in probabilistic models that, that uh, are mixed effects, hierarchical models that really address this kind of transfer learning um, problem. Challenge, actually. Um, you, you mentioned the Wirecard case uh, at the very end of your presentation. Can you, can you share maybe some insights uh, on uh, how you constructed, how you defined the predictor? Um, certainly. So I'm not just gonna... um, the predictor is basically so. So what we have, I'm still sharing my screen. I might just want to. We won't see your screen, unfortunately. It's too small. No. Okay, fair enough. Um, so the way it does is that uh, we we work with a concept which is called event risk. So we see that event risk accumulates over a time, and the way you do it, you can very much compare it to Volkswagen, for example. So Volkswagen had a huge emission scandal, and um, to ex senior management took steps later to remediate this. So we have the situation that that markets respond positively to uh, CEO Müller leaving the company because they realize now this is a change in strategy. Nothing of this happened with Wirecard. At the end, we had something which called event risk debt overhang. So the day before, you, you can actually compare this. It's, it's in the slides. Uh, this was our key indicator. The day before, they actually disclosed bankruptcy. They never really came up with some viable solution to all those outstanding problems that had caused, that had caused prices to fall dramatically in the past. And this is really the kind of event risk that we extract and that we make accessible and available for, for further analysis. So just for example, predicting that, you know, you shouldn't be um, invested in Wirecard. That was, yeah. <laughs> That's a great advice. And next question, maybe. Inside bias, I guess. So yeah, there's, there's a video of me in early 2019 on a, on a conference talking about Wirecard in detail. <laughs> we'll find the link in there. Yes, Perfect, sorry. we will check it out. So to the juries, is there any further question? Not? If not, we have two from the departments. Um, Stefan, how do you measure, quantify or slash quantify similarity between entities and counterparties. Entities and counterparties. I cannot. I'm not quite sure I understand the question correctly. Okay, then let's maybe skip to the next one. Do you think your approach of predicting price movements could be used to predict the movement of spreads of CDS contracts, hence providing a way to forecasting possible PD shifts? So um, this is a great question and I'm very happy to answer it because the, the whole concept is based on my research on option pricing at the LSE. The whole idea was to use the jump diffusion model, which is based on equity prices, where you would use a geometric Brownian motion, uh, which is a different distribution really. So yes, you can do it for, 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 for spreads. You would just use an orange and Winback process for this, for, uh, for example. And this is really what I want to stress and highlight that we are data scientists. We work with this data. We have experience working with this data. You can use it for 
for derivatives, you can use it for, for commodities. It really depends on the way you, you set up your models to understand parametrically, non-parametrically from the distribution where to find anomalies. And that's really what we do. Okay. So yes, you can. Perfect. With that having said, we're over the time. Five minutes are over. Thank you very much for your presentation and your insights. Now we will, we will jump over to London. We have Panos from Spin Analytics here with us today. Panos, can you hear me? Yes, hello everyone. Panos, the stage is yours or you can see your screen? Okay, your yes. five minutes start now. Okay, thank you for inviting us at the Buddhist Bank Innovation uh, Challenge. Uh, my name is Panos Kliamis, I'm the CEO of uh, Spin Analytics and today we'll present you how you can take advantage of a risk robot with an explainable AI automation in credit risk management, and it's used by global tier one banks already. Uh, the challenges and use cases that we identified and we think that we can apply directly our technology are about banking supervision, economics, and financial stability. Uh, 2020, it's a year that uh, uh, because of credit uh, risk management uh, issues with COVID-19 is going to be a significant year that will affect all the models of the banks and the banks have to redevelop the models. In the same way, a Buddhist bank has to take into consideration that the economy and data is not directly connected because today we have a lot of signals that uh, actually with COVID-19 are changing uh, how we have to uh, follow the modeling process. So these alarming signals uh, create implications on banking sector and uh, so actually, what is the potential consequence? Uh, there are a lot, and uh, there are two places that uh, we call capital requirements and lending decisions that are going to be affected uh, completely. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, the alarm signals uh, and implications on banking sector are not directly connected because uh, there is a missing link there, and uh, the teams have to develop a model or more models in order to understand uh, what's going on and uh, how to react. The time to react is quite slow, and this is because actually it's a manual business. We would like to present you Risk Robot, which actually solves that uh, once and for all, because it's a bridge that the uh, Risk Robot is providing the bridge of what happen, uh, happens in the real economy in a scenario and how banks will be affected in their capital requirements and their lending decisions. And there are a lot of uh, ways to use this robot as it can uh, digest uh, banking data, alternative data, historical data, and expert judgment, which is a must have uh, with COVID 19. And this means that you can have real time uh, indication, a real time uh, reaction on the economic impact, uh, and especially because banking sector is a must uh, have for the uh, goodwill uh, and uh, nice uh, uh, organization of the economy. Uh, today, the teams and uh, the Buddhist Bank team as well, they use traditional uh, generic tools that are all uh, generic and not uh, focused on one uh, modeling process only, which means that they have to spend a lot of time, which usually in, is in months, uh, to just develop one credit risk model or economic models. We would like to present you that with the combination of your team, with uh, the experts that you have at Deutsche Buddhist Bank and Risk Robot, you can decrease the time uh, in minutes instead of months. And this is something that we validated globally. And you can do the usual modeling business, but also more with alternative, uh, non-alternative, traditional or non-traditional modeling methodologies. And you can also add your own methodology inside. Uh, we would like to present you also an ecosystem approach that we think it will help the German banking sector specifically, since you are uh, supervising them where you can collect all the data uh, from the banks uh, in real time. You can redevelop the models in real time and you can have supervision in real time. And this is more than 10x speed from what's happening today. Uh, this is a platform that has a unique uh, approach. It can uh, digest data, as I said, from any resources, internal or external. We're talking about credit or economic models. And it's an easy way to have a fast stress testing or a, a fast date, a test on new data. And also we have an X AI, explainable AI uh, direction since the model documentation, it's exported by the software in a couple of minutes. And it's usually a document more than 300 pages that uh, the banks uh, that were working use for the regulators like ECB and uh, Buddhist Bank, uh, German Bank. But uh, uh, 
you can use in order to analyze the model how it was developed. We have tested that in multiple jurisdictions with multiple portfolios, multiple kinds of uh, modeling, and it's working always uh, and, and it's consistent. A uh, risk robot can be combined with your team and create unlimited stress testing, streamlining, auditability, compliance, and uh, monitoring. Uh, so you can check what's going on in the banking sector and uh, understand how the economy will react. So this is because our team is quite uh, experts in our field. We have one of the strongest team uh, as a fintech in uh, credit risk uh, management with a lot of experience. We are present in three continents with multiple banking projects. And we have won more than 40 awards in the last uh, three years globally. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for your time. We, we are, thank you very much for this final word. Next to him, Julian will join the Q&A uh, that, uh, that he just introduced. Let's jump into the Q&A with the judges. So let's start with the first question. I would like to, uh, how would you set up the stress testing um, in traditional stress testing approaches, the most time is in the preparation and the collection of the data from the banks. Uh, the actual computation then is uh, pretty quickly done. Why can you speed up 10 times? Yes. Julian? So an important part of Risk Robot is the system that we have for automating the extraction and data preparation stage. This can take up to 70% of the time that banks spend on their modeling process. Our solution uh, significantly outperforms other data preparation tools because it is very much um, embedded with knowledge of what the data actually mean from a credit risk perspective. That means it can clean the data much more effectively. That means that the data preparation data cleaning process can be fully automated and the amount of manual intervention that is required minimized. Mm -hmm. uh, may I add a question here? Um, well, we are of course uh, also dreaming of a kind of uh, real-time uh, automated, uh, automated monitoring and uh, uh, supervision. And one of the main obstacles we see is the mapping of the data. So the data, which is uh, granular data or other data in the banks uh, to a system which applies for all the banks, uh, even though the uh, data storage and data definition uh, in the data fields in the various banks are completely different and uh, heterogeneous. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question because it's quite a bad line. Um, is it a question about um, how much can be done without getting a complete data set from all of the banks? Was that the point? No, I try, I try again, uh, speak a little bit up. Um, so how do you uh, manage the mapping of the data? Uh, we have 1,500 banks, they have all different systems uh, but to use a robot we need to um, to mitigate these data in a general um, uh, in a general system so the data from the banks have to be mapped into our data fields so how how do you deal with that okay um, so the uh, first point to make is that Whenever we work with a client, then we typically have to draw data from multiple data sources and bring them together. The uh, data preparation stage in RIS Robot is built to do that, to consolidate the data into a single integrated data set. That's part of how it works. But the other point I would seek to make is that the idea of real-time supervision is just one of the applications we envisage because fundamentally what risk robot does is it takes the credit risk modeling process and reduces the amount of time it takes down to minutes and allows you to scale that process 
So if, for example, you wanted to create a simulation of your banking ecosystem with a number of uh, artificially constructed proxies with proxy portfolios and a number of models to fully model how that, um, if you like, environment of banks would behave, you could do that. A small team within the Bundesbank could easily manage the construction of the several hundred models that would be required. And then the process of rebuilding and recalibrating those models in hundreds or thousands of different scenarios based upon new data coming in could be fully automated. Bridging the gap between constructing a economic scenario and actually understanding what the impact on the economy would be through changes in lending behavior or capital requirements, et cetera. Similarly, whenever you're building an economic model, economic models are very similar to the credit risk models. We obviously use economic models in stress testing. What we do is we build an ecosystem in which you can combine expert judgment, modeling expertise, credit theory, economic theory, and statistical modeling in a way that can accelerate the whole modeling process to minutes instead of months. And so this has broad ap applicability across a range of applications in a number of different challenges. So I wouldn't want to place too much emphasis on just the idea of the real-time supervision. That is an attractive area to explore, but there are many other opportunities as well, which I see. Thank you very much, Julian. The time is over. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Panos. So we will now dive into the last two startups. The next one with us is Skuro. Welcome, Dr. Dorian Zeltz, to be here on the show. Hello. Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, guten Tag nach Perfect. Frankfurt. We can uh, see my name is Dorian. Screen. I'm uh, the co-founder and Let's CEO start. of Skuro, and it's a privilege to walk you through um, what we do and what we have accomplished over the past two days. Um, the challenge is this, uh, most of you probably have seen that a few years ago, the most valuable resource. The reality though is this, that is what the amount of data actually is used. Now the question is, why is that? And we had heard a lot about knots today already about unstructured data, but look, let's look at it. This is what you see to the left. It's an um, earnings transcript from Thomson Reuters. And it's human text, we all understand. The real difficulty is to make this computationally understandable um, as to make uh, something out of it. And additionally, much of this data, you just spoke about that, uh, Professor Vermeling, is spread across from many, many different systems, many market participants. Would you be able to tie that all together into one single data fabric? You'd be able actually to get new insights either into market risks or into new market participants. And that's exactly what we do over here at Squirrel, um, actually focus on insights. The team uh, that I have the privilege um, to be part of is a team of serial entrepreneurs. We build a number of companies prior amongst them, Switzerland's largest um, search engine and also built up in Frankfurt an e-business consultancy 20 years ago. Um, today we work with Squirrel uh, predominantly in the financial services sector um, but also with industrials uh, around the globe. Now, what do we do? The approach is pretty simple, and we have heard echoes of that throughout the afternoon. You take data, you try to create a computational understanding of these data sets, and then you start to act on these data sets. I want, before going under the hood, make one point here. For a bank like the Bundesbank, I think it's important to note that while us, the two, we built this all cloud first, it's not yet a full reality for heavily regulated companies and sensitive data sets like the Bundesbank has. So our software solution while built cloud first works on-prem predominantly. Under the hood, it's a bit more complex. Under the hood, uh, we have over the past years developed the full framework to take data, to map different data sets together. That's the enrich and relate part. Um, then we have developed a multitude of machine learning methods to actually extract insights out of these data sets. We come to some examples in a moment. And then the third piece, which is as important, it's a prescriptive, proactive um, alert 
uh, to the person in charge of a specific, as an example, risk assessment um, to get uh, their job done faster and better. Um, here you can profit actually, would you work with us, from a whole range of pre-built um, models, plus with the Data Science Studio allow you to build your own models. Now let's look where we apply that. We apply that today already at your counterpart at the Bank of England, who has selected us competitively to work with them in that actually their supervisory uh, function where we take data from various internal data sources together, weave that come actually from their banks that report to them, weave that into one single data fabric and allow their supervisory function in a very accurate way to identify risks earlier than ever before. And important to note, it's not that we do try to automate the risk assessment for them, but we do automate all the previous grant work to get to that assessment so that the supervisory function can do what they're really supposed to do. In that sense, we also looked at the challenges that you presented to us. Banking supervision, yes, we do think we can apply a lot of the learnings that we did on the other side of the channel to the Bundesbank too. That is a comprehensive AI-driven um, risk signal library and get a comprehensive approach to this. In the same way, we looked at this other challenge um, that you post, the FinTech monitoring challenge, we have done similar work with a number of companies in Switzerland and elsewhere, where we do monitoring of market risks, say in the food industry, where we do monitoring of new startups, insure techs, and more. In conclusion, what we would love to do with you, uh, we looked at those use cases. They're all a bit the same, unifying of data to gain insight. Would you work with us? You would get a out of the box central bank approved platform that allows you in a pragmatic way to look at new ways to look at risk. Um, thank you again for all the participants, also for TechQuartier for organizing that challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. You're perfectly on time. We will dive directly into the Q&A with our judges. So first question. How exactly do you want to identify fintechs in the fintech mentioned case? Yeah, fair point. Um, there is two or three elements to this. First of all, uh, there is a lot of especially premium data sources that do track the startup space. Pitchbook is one example. Many, many others are there out there. Second, um, there are um, third party data services, predict leads, a Slovenian company as an example come to mind that do actually do actively market monitor this. Third, um, you as a bank, you will have an insight into who you look for. What you do then is you weave that all into a, a number of, um, I call them fingerprints, bit like signals, against which you in a funnel perspective, look at which stage, at what type of startup you look at. Let's be clear, none of this will ever be perfect because a new startup that just saw the light of the day yesterday Nobody will have that on its radar. So it needs a certain level of maturity to actually be able to retrieve any signal about them. No data, no AI. That's probably the simplistic way. But if you have data, then you're going to get to those signals early. Thank you very much. Is there a further question? That sounds very promising. Uh, what are the drawbacks of your approach? What we do is, given our expertise, as we have built Switzerland's largest search engine some 17 years ago or so, uh, search is all about probabilities, right? If you do it with us, local CH, or whether we do it with Google, it's all about probabilities. Machine learning is all about pattern detection. What we do with our approach, we combine those two. So don't ever use us um, uh, to analyze a wire card balance sheet. I would not claim that. Other people on this uh, pitch today make that point. Because this probabilistic approach will not serve you to detect this type of numeric patterns precisely. What it does, though, is to a point that was made earlier, um, many, many data sets from many, many vendors do come in many, many different shapes and forms. This probabilistic approach uh, that is combined with machine learning allows you to get to the um, inspect to the to the object of desire, right? To get to the object of desire with a probabilistic approach ever closer. 
right? Um, whereas most other approaches, especially machine learning to deterministic approaches, taxonomies, you have it, good, map it, if not, fail. This combination of probabilistic approaches with machine learning allow us to actually deal with um, the gray data that is not well structured. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have further questions? Not. We received one from the departments. Since you're an expert on NLP, any thoughts on what is better, BERT, B E R T, or BERT or ELMO? Sorry, I don't know <laughs> if you're new. Um, happily, and we already did to your colleagues, uh, send a um, video of our data science studio where we use both approaches. Um, the answer is a bit loyally, apologize for that. Um, it depends a lot on the underlying data set and what you want to achieve. BERT, as an example, if you have very good um, um, language data sets without too much noise, noise as an example, an email footer, BERT is wonderful. But as an example, if you have, say, email customer interactions where there is a lot of noise, aka, say, email footers, multiple threats, um, either you invest unbelievable amounts of energy in cleaning out that noise or you deploy, as an example, fast text or other models uh, to uh, get to a better result. So the, the answer is a bit lawyerly. We, we have accumulated a lot of experience and built that into the data science studio to allow people to choose and select what's best as a function of their input data set in terms of unstructured data. Perfect. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, with that, the time is up. Thank you for being here. I wish you great luck for uh, the challenge Thank here you. tonight. Uh, we will now join or uh, join to the last startup of this night. The last startup is joining us from uh, Valencia. He there, um, uh, they're vandalized. So we will directly call in uh, Roger Fernandez. Are you there? I'm here, indeed. Thank you Hi. very much. You can uh, share your screen. Are you ready for the pitch? Perfect. Yes, I'm your ready. five. So you see my screen. Yep, we can see your screen. Your five minutes start now. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, let me begin by saying how excited I am uh, for being here and for having the opportunity to explain you how we build uh, risk monitoring applications uh, based on machine learning for the Bundes Bank. Before I begin, I would like to tell you um, why we were born and what is the problem that we're solving. The problem is that banks and insurers enterprises customers data is often inaccurate and incomplete, adding manual tasks and generating new risks and changes in the risk exposure. We know a solution applies machine learning models from open data sources to adapt enterprises risk assessment to real risks and automate processes. We have international presence counting with insurance um, companies, banks, the European Commission as our clients. And in our team, we have a background in insurance, uh, expertise in data protection, as well as uh, reporting to the European Central Bank. So the way the platform works is very simple. We gather and process information from enterprises based on public registers, customer reviews, business websites, and many, many other data sources. We enrich this data and we build based on that, build uh, risk indicators. And we send this information to an API or a web application to the financial institution to be used uh, for these purposes. So we first find the data of these enterprises. And after the time, we control how this data is evolving in order to make sure that we have the highest quality of data possible. We also keep adding risk indicators that are not traditionally considered by financial institutions, but can be found online. And after that, we combine some of these risk indicators uh, to build uh, risk indicators that help us to sort and better segment um, these customers. These risk indicators are very helpful in order to understand from an aggregated point of view 
how can we sort, classify, and divide uh, these large data sets, but we also can zoom in to see the risk of one individual company. So we can go from one individual company to one specific industry, one region, or even one country. So what are we proposing to the Bundesbank? We propose three business cases applying to statistics, economics, and risk controlling. For statistics, what we propose is to build a system that helps to classify and monitor fintech or other disruptive industries, understanding what are the business activities of these fintechs, what services they are uh, offering, whether they are offering B2B or B2C businesses, what connections they have, if they are working with financial institutions outside or inside the EU, the size, the funding received, and who funded them. And we also will control how these aspects are evolving to have a complete uh, data map of the fintech situation and activity. For economics, what we propose is to track all the economic events that we can identify online, depending on the industry or the region, in order to identify unusual behaviors. For example, if we see that one industry all of a sudden is increasing uh, the way they are offering and selling their products online, or if we see that in one specific region, uh, all the restaurants uh, all of a sudden are starting to close their business. The idea here is to identify these events and how the Bundesbank to act before the consequences are to be. For risk controlling, what we propose is to enrich the risk models with alternative data. So we will be using uh, data such as how the activity of the businesses and the industries are changing, how the locations are changing, other aspects about how digital they are, how they are adapting to um, economical crisis. And by that, the aim is to increase the accuracy of the risk models and also be more approximated to the real risk, considering that the data we are using is updated. So in sum, we propose to use aggregated online business data to first track new industries activities and the evolution, for example, FinTech. Secondly, to monitor industries activities and predict economic events. And third, increase the risk control model accuracy. And we're over time. I need to, your last, you're on the last slide, your last sentence. I was on the last slide, yeah, I just finished. Perfect, <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Let's join the Q&A. Next to him is Carlos Albo with the call. Uh, let's start with the first question. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting approach. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on your risk controlling ideas. Uh, how flexible is your approach? So, for example, if we would now take ecologic risks into consideration, uh, could you also enrich the data set, for example, by the CO2 footprint of the company? Yes. Um, the platform that we have is ready to implement uh, new data points and new aspects. We can uh, try to see how can we identify these uh, ecological aspects of these businesses. So for example, if they have any kind of uh, action or certificate on their website, and we could be tracking this. The way we will be delivering this will be in uh, three parts. First, the unstructured data we found. Secondly, uh, the result of processing this data. And third, the result of this data in an aggregated way. Uh, we will be completely transparent about this. Okay. Thank you very much. Next question. Are there any further questions? Can you can you tell us a little more about your traction so far in the market? References. Yes. So we started uh, in the insurance market. The idea was to build the system in order to help them automate uh, and writing process. So basically using online data in order to help insurance companies um, to short the, the quoting process that they have. Uh, then we evolved to also help them to have a better view on the risk evolution of their customers. So what we saw is that usually they will have outdated data, for example, that they got uh, two or three years ago, and this data hasn't changed. However, uh, what we see is that uh, businesses and uh, corporates are constantly changing, 
they are constantly changing their business activities, the size of the business, the locations they work, or even the industry. So we want to make sure is that we have the highest uh, data quality in this sense. So um, I would like to add that then, then we move to the bank center, sector uh, or industry because we realize that we are using the same information and getting the same information for that. So it's used in any is 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 useful anyway for for bank industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there are no further question, one short question from the department: Is your service cloud or is it on premise, or also available on premise? It can be both. It's always a good question. <laughs> Answer. <laughs> Thank <laughs> yeah. you. That was short. As a follow up on that. There was a further question. Is it a black box or can we see which features drive your risk indicator? No. In, for us, um, the machine learning uh, models that we use, they are supervised and um, do that we are already. So, so now yeah, I your think I, I, back. I can complete that. Uh, yeah, okay. So. Carlos was saying that the machine learning uh, models we're using are always supervised. Uh, we are always checking um, how they are working and also have a very uh, high commitment with data ethics. And we're also uh, transparent with uh, our clients. We tell them what kind of data we're using and uh, how are we building these models. Uh, we actually always build the models together because we are not trying to replace their models. What we are trying to do is to add external data to improve them. Perfect. Thank you very much. So Thank if you. there are no further question, then we can close this round of nine startups. Our judge, uh, judges have now the time to take the time to evaluate all the pitches. We, to recap, we had nine really great solutions. We have seen how they uh, want to implement their solutions to the use cases and challenges of the Bundesbank. So now we will have a short time break to, uh, for, for 15 minutes, 10 minutes, where we have the opportunity to, first of all, vote your favorite uh, startup by yourself. So we have a public voting. Uh, the winner of the public voting, of course, um, will get, uh, get a really cool prize also from us from TechWart here. After that, so Selmas or one of my colleagues is posting the link to the public voting on Mentimeter into the YouTube chat. So uh, vote for your, pub, uh, for your favorite startups. After that, so we will now go into a break where you see a short video from Alicia from Schenk on our platform, uh, who recorded on our platform Tech Hippo. Tech Hippo is our provider that the startups have been working on over the last days. So this is our technology platform that we use for our programs. You will see the re uh, uh, video, it is recorded with that also they had the startups had the opportunity to see over the last days as an input. It is based on ethics on AI. The minute is 11 minutes. After that, we will see you back. Enjoy the video. See you after the, we have the results and uh, evaluate the results of the public voting. Bye. So welcome to this last lesson on the economics and ethics of AI. So in this last lesson, we will talk about big data, but also about human and algorithmic biases. So let, let me start by some examples of what can happen if there is an algorithmic bias. So I read the first one uh, up here. I am a nice person. I hate old people. Hitler was right. I hate Jews. Bush caused 9-11 himself and Hitler would have done a better job than the monkey we have now. Our only hope now is Donald Trump. Or I hate all feminists. They should burn in hell. So this is probably a quite shocking example of what can go wrong um, when, you, when you have an AI algorithm um, that, does, that, that is trained on data that is somehow biased. So in particular, this is an example of what a chatbot um, developed by Microsoft wrote on Twitter. So this was a chatbot, Tay. Um, and this was a very extreme example because at the beginning the chatbot started to talk about puppies and everything was quite nice. But then within very few hours um, it came out that the chatbot developed to be a really extreme, uh, extreme have really, really extreme views and, um, and also distribute very hateful propaganda. Said that Microsoft had to turn it down and put it offline and publicly also excused for, for this uh, somehow social experiment. 
We have another example here. So this is an example from Google Translate. Um, and there is a translation from a language, which is in this case, Hungarian. And this is a language where there's no real uh, gender. So it's, it's just a neutral, a neutral language, language in this sense. Um, and there, they ha there are different job titles. And you can see that when Google translates these, uh, these sentences with job titles, what comes out is that she's a nurse, he's a scientist, he's an engineer, she's a baker, he's a teacher, she's a wedding organizer, and he's a CEO. So definitely here is also some sort of algorithmic bias uh, and the gender bias that, um, that you can see in this translation. So these are just uh, some examples of misbehaved AIs. When we talk about algorithmic bias, um, there's one professor called Catherine Tucker, which is very active in this field. And she does a lot about gender bias and algorithmic bias. And uh, she has a study that explores data from a field test of how an algorithm delivered ads promoting job opportunities in the STEM fields. So in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. The ad was in principle explicitly intended to be gender neutral in its delivery, but empirically they found out that much or significantly fewer women saw the ad than men. So that's also what you can see up here. Significantly fewer, fewer women were actually able to see this ad. And this happened because younger, younger women were price demographic and they were just more expensive to show the ad to. So if you have an algorithm that simply optimizes cost effectiveness in ad delivery, it will always deliver ads that were intended to be gender neutral, apparently in a discriminatory way. So um, they also show in the study that this empirical regularity extends to many, many different major digital platforms. So you might think at this point that a solution to deal with this algorithmic bias could be to start two different campaigns one campaign explicitly targeting only males and one campaign explicitly targeting only females and then balance, uh, balance the genders to which the ad is delivered yourself. However, this solution is not possible because when you try to, um, to, to do such a campaign, the ad will, will automatically be not approved by the platform because targeting an employment ad toward only one gender is not in compliance with the federal law. So it's just not possible to work explicitly yourself against this algorithmic bias. And this is maybe something which already shows you that here is all definitely some sort of problematic thing. Okay, let's talk a bit about, switch a bit and talk a bit about big data. So here's a quote about big data by Hal Varian, which is ch uh, chief economist at Google. And he says, a billion hours ago, modern Homo sapiens emerged. A billion minutes ago, Christianity began. A billion seconds ago, the IBM PC was released. A billion Google searches ago was this morning. And this probably already tells you that we have huge amounts of data which are currently available and where these algorithms are trained on. But with big data training, uh, training algorithms and this data also being generated by humans, you can imagine that within these training data, you have some sort of human biases. And from an economics point of view, there are many, many different human biases which relate to all sorts of different things, like for instance, time inconsistencies, but also gender bias. Um, and on these biases, biases there are also very different theoretical models and also studies on that. So let's maybe mention some examples. One example here is the uh, so-called IKEA effect. So this is the tendency of people to place a disproportionately high value on objects that they partially assembled themselves, such as furniture from IKEA. Another example uh, is loss aversion. So loss aversion means that there's that the perceived disutility of giving up an object is greater than the utility associated with acquiring the object. And then you have uh, the self-serving bias, which is the tendency to claim more responsibility for successes than for failures, but it may also manifest itself as a tendency for people to evaluate ambiguous information in a way that is beneficial to themselves. A bias that is more related um, to, to timing issues or time inconsistencies is hyperbolic discounting. 
Hyperbolic discounting leads to choices that are inconsistent over time. So people make a choice that their future self would prefer not to have made, despite using the same reasoning. Very prominent uh, example could be you decide to work out tomorrow and today you say I will definitely go and work out tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, your future self will decide, okay, I will not work out today because there is some sort of present bias and there is some sort of inconsistency uh, in this behavior. Other examples could be illusion of control. I think this is very self-explanatory. It's a tendency to overestimate uh, one's degree of influence over external, uh, external events or the false consensus effect, which means the tendency for people to overestimate the degree to which, they actually, uh, to which others actually agree with them. And I could go on here forever. So the, there are so many human biases and some of them are more explored, some are less, but uh, there are very prominent ones like gender bias, but there are t t also time biases and there are many, many, many of them. What now the problem is um, with, with AI is that usually AI has this black box approach. This means that AI systems usually optimize behavior to satisfy a mathematically specified goal um, that is usually chosen by the system designers. But what happens in between input and output is what is usually called a black box. So when you have an AI system for automated decision making, it is often based on machine learning over big data or huge amounts of data. And what it does is, for instance, it maps a user's features into a class predicting the behavioral traits of individuals, such as, for instance, credit risk, health status, and so on. But usually it doesn't expose the reasons why it decided in this or that way. And this is problematic, not only because of the lack of transparency, but also because of possible biases that are inherited by the algorithms from the human prejudice prejudice or, uh, for instance, discrimination that might be, um, might be within the training data that the algorithm gets. This is also why in the last years there was a tendency for uh, what is called explainable AI. So this would be that you provide a transparent machine learning decision model that already provides an explanation of the model's logic by design. So this could be a way of dealing with that. And when you talk in general about prediction versus causality, you have the general problem that spurious correlations can falsely seem to imply a causal link between observations. And there's also an interesting paper about that, which says that there are in general mainly two biases of predictions. So one bias, the first one and you can see in panel A here, is the so-called confounding bias. So what happens here is that you have a common cause for both the exposure or predictor and also for the outcome. In this example, the common cause would be smoking. So this is the confounder and smoking causes on one hand yellow fingers, on the other hand it can also cause lung cancer. When the AI now predicts that yellow fingers lead to lung cancer, this is a correlation but not a causality. So when you want to um, heal lung cancer, it doesn't help to clean your fingers, but you have to go back to the confounder here, to the original cause of lung cancer, which is smoking. And this is something uh, that could be problematic here. On the other hand, you have the so-called collider bias, or what they call the collider bias. This means that you have a common effect of both the exposure or the predictor and the outcome. An example here could be that locomotor disease and respiratory disease will both end up or both cause hospitalization. When now, um, when now the AI observes hospitalization um, or the AI predicts, the AI uses locomotion disease to predict respiratory disease, it doesn't really help you because if you treat respiratory disease, you will not automatically also uh, treat locomotor disease. So this is also a problematic bias. So if you do not include a confounder or if you falsely include a collider in a model, this will always uh, result in a biased association. So this was a lesson on economics and ethics of AI. So thanks for listening and thanks for watching this video. Thank you, Alicia, for this great video. Uh, this was recorded up front, as I already told you. 
Uh, but I think it's a very relevant topic when talking about AI solutions like innovative risk monitoring solutions also talk about the ethics of AI. So thank you for uh, sharing your input and your content here with us here today. So we had a great, uh, to recap, we had a great evening where already it was very intense. We have nine great startups and we're now coming into the final phase of this very event. Uh, this is the moment that we've all been looking forward for so long that we have been planning so long. At this point, I would like to thank everyone that was involved in the whole organization before we dive now into the graduation or and, uh, that was into the, the whole organization team from Tech Quartier, but also from uh, Bundesbank. This was an intense project. It was a great working with you all together to making this today happen. So let's come into the public voting. I saw even though we have the long event, a lot of you voted for your favorite pitch. So even though this is not the final result, uh, here is the first the winner of you that you selected that will win um, a TechWatier membership that we'll continue with working on here from TechWatier from our side. So 123 uh, voted for the results and the final winner of the public voting of the best pitch is our startup Squirrel. He's the winner of the, of the um, public voting from us. So congratulations for that for now Squirrel. We will now go into the next startup um, and we come now to the final, really final uh, evaluation that our judges have made. Uh, for that, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Joachim Wimmeling again. It was a long night. Thank you for joining us again. I hope you enjoyed the part in the, in the jury duty. Now it's your time. Please announce who will win uh, this very challenge. Well, okay. Thank you very much. It was uh, also a sprint to make that decision. Uh, we didn't have so, mu so much time. We even had a technical tool uh, for voting and for scoring, but the time was not sufficient to, uh, to really work through all the uh, questions. Uh, so we had an intense discussion, but with a very broad agreement uh, about the three winners. And uh, we, I would like to start uh, with uh, the third, number, th uh, number three. And this, from my point of view, is Confucio. Congratulations uh, to, that, uh, to that award. Um, we were uh, very much um, uh, excited uh, about the broad technologic, technological base, uh, not only voice, not only text, but also balance sheet, uh, and uh, well, up for improvement and enlargement. So we see a great potential uh, in this techno technological approach and we see many use cases in Bundesbank. Well, now we come to uh, the silver medal, not the silver bullet, the silver metal. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Neusinger. Congratulations. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your ideas. Uh, we found very thrilling uh, the idea of having indirect indicators uh, for the forecast and for the appreciation and for the analyze. And uh, as we are talking about risks, uh, we are so much um, enthusiastic about bad news uh, that we appreciate it very much that you are starting from bad news. Well, now finally come to the winner. Uh, let me come to the first place. Uh, and um, uh, here it's not uh, uh, such a big surprise after you have already uh, noticed uh, the, um, the voting in public. Also, we are very um, thrilled by the uh, ideas uh, of Squirrel. And in particular, because uh, from our point of view, it's a very sophisticated approach. It's uh, the combination between the rather mechanical uh, uh, machine learning with probability judgment seems for us to be a very uh, promising uh, approach. And as we in Bundesbank indeed believe that the pure mechanical calculation of algorithms wouldn't finally uh, be everything, and we needed to combine that with judgment. And as Squirrel proposed also with the traditional methodology 
of uh, probability analysis, uh, we found this uh, the most exciting idea uh, tonight. Congratulations uh, to Switzerland and thank you very much uh, for participation. Yeah, I think great, great choice. Also, that's the public voted. Skurri, congratulations to you. Uh, Mr. Williaming, how will be the next steps? Maybe you can give some insights with the startups. Well, is it, we will indeed have uh, a follow-up with the startups. Uh, we will have to uh, recap all the uh, talks, the dialogues, uh, the ideas uh, we saw, con we had, well, noticed in this condensed uh, format uh, to find out uh, how and with whom uh, to continue. Um, as we are in some areas uh, rather uh, in the beginning. We might also uh, come back to some of the startups which have not been uh, uh, mentioned uh, or not been uh, in the list, uh, high, uh, high onto the list, uh, because there we also need uh, some support. Uh, so please uh, be patient uh, because we have to make up our minds. Uh, but uh, we will, of course, give every, uh, all of you uh, a feedback uh, and get in touch with you uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the debrief and for the further steps. Perfect. I think this is also great news for those that didn't win. Still, congratula uh, congratulations to Neusinger, I, Confucio and the winner is Curry of this very night. I think with this, these were great closing words. Uh, we can f sum up this evening. It was great that you t uh, participated in this whole evening. We are looking forward to see you in the next program. Um, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, journey here uh, of this great milestone. See you soon. Thank you in, in the name of TechWorthy and I think also in the, thing, in the name of the Deutsche Bundesbank. Bye. See you soon. <laughs>